Caravan 7,000 strong is uh, headed this way. They're about 1,140 miles due south of McAllen. This is the closest, nearest port of entry that they could cross. They haven't said where they're going to go. California, Arizona are here, but this would be the shortest route, and that's why so many Hondurans, Guatemalans, and El Salvadorans come here, but unfortunately, most come and come illegally. Yesterday, we laid in the bushes and wait, and we busted one of those smuggling operations. Watch. We've been hiding in the bushes waiting to witness one of these crossings. Let's go. They're coming right now. You can see. You can see they've come in. They've got a family in a raft. Excuse me, sir. Were you trying to cross into America illegally? So what we're witnessing now is clearly a family that was being brought over by that smuggler that was paddling in the raft. This is a... Uh, an attempt to legally cross, and, and they've, they've gone back over there. We've seemed to have fooled this attempt, but officials tell us that he's probably just going to look for another spot. You know, it's a legal crossing? Yes. Yes? But you came anyway? Why? Why did you come, is what I'm asking you. Can you, can you tell me why you came illegally? Uh, the situation of Honduras. You're in Honduras? You're from Honduras? Yes. What are the conditions there? You could not have work in there because um, the criminals always will, will uh, get your money. But they're not all women and children in the last 48 hours. A man wanted for murder in South Carolina was arrested here, along with another member of the 18th Street violent gang. Last year. This should not be a partisan issue. It seems that many in Congress are currently suffering from amnesia. In 2006, Congress passed the Secure Fence Act with broad bipartisan support. Border security is national security and it is vital to our mission of protecting the homeland. I refuse to believe that this is a challenge too complex for the United States Congress to solve. I will continue to call on them to address this crisis we need additional funding to continue building the border wall system. We need personnel to secure the border and we need laws that work for the American people. I wanna thank you for your time today. I wanna to thank all those here from the Department of Homeland Security and in particular today, all those here from CBP. It is my very great honor to serve with them. They are true patriots. They work day in and day out to protect us all. And with that, we'd be happy to take a few of your questions if you'd like. So we have the benefit, and I'm happy to uh, see if the chief or the commissioner have additional uh, comments, but we have the benefit of having amazing uh, planners within CBP. Uh, so what they have done uh, at the operational level with many, many decades of experience is they have scoured the entire border and found those areas that are at the highest risk where we need this wall system of infrastructure, technology, and personnel. We've made the request to Congress. Uh, but at whatever Congress does, we are prepared to continue to focus on those areas from a risk perspective that need the funding that we can use to, to build the wall and build that wall system. Uh, but we do need the wall, so we will continue to ask Congress for additional funds so that we can meet all of our priority areas. Uh, I don't have the specific numbers, but it, it started to, about two or three weeks ago that we started doing, as you know, we do the apprehension, we do the transportation to the station, and then they do the interview. And through the interview, we started seeing that um, the agents are really good at asking specific questions to find out um, their nationality. We started seeing that they were claiming to be from another country like Guatemala, because they knew that Guatemalans, they, the family unit usually stays with us in custody through the process about 20 days and then they're able to walk out with a notice to appear into the United States. So um, through those conversations, we realized, or the agents came, uh, realized that they were Mexican nationals because they didn't have a lot of that information and eventually they admitted to being the Mexican nationals um, with uh, residency obviously in Mexico. So we're starting to see that trend. Um, not only that situation, we also have um, others, right? Uh, where they are claiming to be adults they're claiming to be a, an adult dad with a minor child, 
And in fact, they're both adults and it's not a minor. And then through conversations and interviews, we are able to determine that fact that they are not related. There's no familiar relationship. These are just two individuals that know the system. So then they play it out. But the good thing is we have some extraordinary agents with great skill sets that are able to interview those folks. Yeah. Sure. So let me take the second one first, uh, and then you'll have to remind me if I forget the first one. Uh, the second half, as I mentioned yesterday, we have put in a request for assistance to the Department of Defense. Uh, we have asked for engineering support, logistics support, uh, engineering support, of course, it would include uh, vehicle barriers, pedestrian barriers. Uh, so we make that request to the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense then determines how to meet that request. What is the best way uh, in terms of force composition uh, supplies? This, as you know, is just how we do any request with DOD when it comes to our other mission sets. So I spoke to General O'Shaughnessy yesterday from uh, NORTHCOM. Uh, he is the operational commander in this instance, uh, and he will be working with us to meet our request. So I don't have any information with respect to particular troop numbers. Uh, that's up to DOD to meet our request. On your first question, uh, I think what's important to note here is we are real time, not only working uh, moment to moment with our partners to the south, uh, but we are working with all parts of the federal interagency uh, to ensure that absolutely every option is on the table. We are looking at every possible way within the legal construct that we have to make sure that those who do not have a legal right to come to this country are do not come in uh, and or are immediately apprehended, detained, and removed. So everything is on the table. Uh, we are working through that and discussing uh, what that would mean in terms of implications operationally uh, and, of course, what would work the best because that's what we want to find is the best solution. So I think the, the big problem is, uh, and we've used these stats before, but bear with me because they really are, are important. Uh, the way that our system works, we have a very low threshold for what we call the initial, excuse me, initial credible fear interview. Uh, we have about 90, 80, 90% that pass that interview. Once that occurs, they then come into the United States, they're given a work permit, and they begin to go through the asylum process, which involves the judicial system and immigration judges. At the end of that process, we have a 700,000 backlog currently. At the end of that process, only 20% are determined by a judge to meet the United States statutory requirements for asylum. So what we're asking Congress to do is, we've got to change the laws. That gap is too big. Uh, it prevents us from helping those who truly need asylum quickly, and it also enables many, unfortunately, to either not understand our system and or to purposefully, fraudulently attempt to leverage the system to gain entry into the United States. So the answer to the question, first and foremost, is we've got to work with Congress. They've got to help us change the laws so that we can protect those who need it and we can make sure that nobody uses uh, and, and takes, takes our humanitarian uh, benefits uh, up fraudulently. So we have a, a very tactical operational relationship with the FBI on many, many issues. Uh, we're working with them on election security right now. Uh, we work with them on counterterrorism. We work with them on transnational criminal organizations. We certainly work with them whenever there's a threat to the homeland. So we are embedded in their uh, joint terrorism task forces. Uh, we work together in fusion centers. Uh, we work together through a variety of other operational and policy means. Within the department, the Secret Service, of course, has lead on protecting uh, protectees uh, 
uh, under under the law. Uh, but we also have the Federal Protective Service within the Department of Homeland Security, and that is how we have raised uh, the level of security at all federal buildings throughout the nation. That's also part of our role. So we work in different ways. A lot of it is information sharing based. Uh, we have intelligence and analysis directorate within uh, DHS that's part of the intel community. Uh, so we're connected that way. And then what we do is in conjunction with FBI, we message out. So we've put messages out to the governors, to the Homeland Security Advisors, to critical infrastructure owners and operators to tell them what to look for, uh, what they should report, how they should report, and to make sure that they have as much information uh, as possible. So we're, it, the short answer is it's routine, uh, the way in which we operate. What we've done differently here is it's all hands on deck, all hands on deck 24-7 until we bring these, this person or persons to justice. Uh, I, I would, what I'd like to do is defer to the uh, press conference this afternoon from FBI. I don't want to get ahead of them, but they will uh, detail out uh, the investigation that has occurred to date. They do have lead, uh, how it has worked, how they have collaborated and with whom, uh, and what their intent is uh, to bring uh, the perpetrators to justice. Go far right. Far right. Yeah, so uh, first of all, we're working closely uh, with the uh, Mexican government, all parts of the Mexican government. As you know, the Mexicans have offered asylum uh, to everybody in this caravan, either in the form of asylum or refugee status uh, via assistance from the United Nations High Commissioner on Refugees. So the first part of the plan uh, is to make sure that those who need asylum are granted asylum as quickly as possible so that they do not have to take a dangerous journey uh, to our border. Uh, the Mexican government uh, are also working on a variety of other options. I'm sure you'll hear from them soon on how they plan to address uh, the humanitarian needs, uh, but also to make sure uh, that those uh, who proceed do so in an orderly way. From our perspective, we fully intend uh, to continue to tell those who come here that if you do not have a legal right to enter the United States, you will not be allowed in. Uh, if you sneak across our border, you will be apprehended and you will be returned. In terms of specifics, I don't have an announcement to make today, uh, but in the days to come, as you know, they're about a thousand miles away. Uh, in the days to come, we will be making announcements on additional measures that we are looking at within our legal uh, construct to ensure that this is an orderly process and that those who have no right to be in our country uh, are able to be apprehended quickly and removed. Um, Indiana hat in the back. Uh, in relation to the uh, Secure Defense Act of 2006 that you mentioned earlier, would it be appropriate to uh, classify this as a, as a fence and not a wall? And if so, why not? <laughs> so to me, this, this looks like a wall. Uh, it's 30 feet tall. Uh, I think the difference is it's it not only is it see-through, which helps uh, operationally, as the folks behind me uh, will tell you, but it's different than a fence in that it's part of a system. So it also has technology, some of which you can see, uh, some of which uh, you can't uh, purposefully. It includes the personnel. Uh, it includes uh, roads uh, so that we can patrol. It's a full wall system. Part of it is the infrastructure, the physical barrier that serves as that initial impedance and denial. Uh, looking at this, uh, I, I would not attempt to climb it. Uh, our hope is that it does just that. It serves as that impedance and prevents uh, a flow over. Uh, I, I, it's, it's a wall. This is uh, what the president has asked us to do. It's part of a system. We'll take last question for any of folks up here. Um, we'll go right here. Opposing the troops coming here because of the economy we get from Mexico is so vital to this very poor county. How will it look if we have troops here? How will it affect our economy? Do you take that into consideration? Uh, we always take the economy in consideration. Uh, part of CBP's mission, uh, in addition to protecting uh, our border, securing our border, uh, is to facilitate legal trade and travel. They take that tremendously seriously. I'll turn it over in a minute uh, here to the commissioner. Uh, but everything we do, we absolutely want to make it as easy as possible for legal trade and travel to occur. Uh, we have a great partnership with Mexico. We trade with them. As you know, people come back and back and forth across legally every day, uh, bringing kids to school, going shopping, going to their jobs. Uh, we don't want to impede that. Part of our mission is to enable that, uh, to increase that legal trade and travel. But Commissioner, did you want to? Sure. 
Absolutely. We, we deal with a number of operational contingencies every day on the border and, and make a real effort to make sure that we can uh, process that lawful flow. 700,000 people a day, several hundred thousand vehicles. We know how important it is to Imperial County and really all of our, our border communities around the U.S., as well as uh, over a billion dollars of, of trade exchange with Mexico in about 40 states. So it's not just a border issue. It's a critical economic relationship, I think, is recognized by uh, the agreement in principle for a new trade agreement to modernize NAFTA with the United States, Mexico and Canada agreement. Thank you. All right. Thank you, guys.